Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from Isaiah, beginning in chapter 36, and then we'll kind of jump a little bit over to 37, and then all the way back to chapter 2, uh, part of this narrative story that we have been going through from the beginning of creation through now to where Israel and Judah, now not one nation but two, and last week we talked about and learned about the prophet Micah. The prophet Micah was also prophesying in the country the same time that the prophet Isaiah was prophesying in the city. And so we have the same time period as last week, but we've made it all the way to Israel and Judah being divided kingdoms. And actually, Israel has already been taken over by the Assyrians. Their enemies to the north have come and completely plundered all of Israel and now are encroaching into Judah as well. And so the prophet Isaiah records this time in history with the king Hezekiah. Hear the word of God. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. The king of Assyria went to Rabshaki, to the king of Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. He stood at the conduit of the upper pool of the highway to the fuller's field. And there came out to him Elkim, who was in charge of the palace, and Sh and Shabina, sorry, got that one, uh, the secretary, and so they met at this place. So you have, so you clarify all these names or whatever, you have the person representing the king of Assyria, that's Rabsheki, and he comes out to speak to whoever is going to listen to him on behalf of the king of Assyria, and so representatives from the king Hezekiah, who's the king of Judah, come out and meet him there. So we've got representatives from the king of Assyria and the king of Judah all meeting together. Then Rebsheki stood and called out in a loud voice in a language of Judah, hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. For every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you by saying, the Lord will save us. Has any of the gods of the nations saved their land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods? Where are the gods? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these countries have saved their countries out of my hand, that the Lord should save Jerusalem out of my hand? When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. He covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he went to Elkim who was in charge of the palace, and to the secretary, and to the senior priests, covered with sackcloth and ashes, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz. He said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that your, God, your Lord, your God, heard the words of Rebsheki, whom his master and king of Assyria has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up in prayer for the remnant that is left. 
When the servants of the king of Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own hand. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Our Lord, our God, we hear the stories of our ancestors and we try to follow and understand. And yet sometimes it seems obscured to us. Lord God, help us to clearly see what you have for us this day, to clearly understand your steadfast love for us in your words. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So as I wrestled through these passages this last week, I was actually helped greatly by the group that gathers at Islands every Tuesday at 5.30, our Church in the Wild group. And as we looked at this story about Hezekiah, I was asked, well, what is the message to you? And I tried to come up with something while holding darling uh, er, uh, Erilyn. Erilyn. I'm like, Ariel. Ariel. <laughs> Erilyn. Trying to get my head together, which was not that easy. Fortunately, one of the members of that group sent me an email later and said this. So... I know I asked you about the message last night of the scripture, so I asked myself what message I got. I guess it's kind of simple. How do we compare to the king? As Isaiah told him, one more time, Hezekiah, trust in God and quit worrying about the future. Tearing your clothes, moaning and groaning, running in circles, screaming and shouting are driven by your lack of faith. The Lord will provide an answer, so knock it off. <laughs> so that whole story I told with all the names that get confusing and all the language and all that simply boils down to trust in God, knock it off. That's what it comes down to. But I thought I need to look a little deeper into this story of Hezekiah. Just who is this King Hezekiah of Judah and what's his backstory? So his backstory is this, Hezekiah was a great reformer. Now I've said this before, that in the uh, history of Israel and Judah, they started out with good kings, then David, then Solomon, and from there on it kind of was a downhill. Each king that took over after that, the kingdom divided, and each king got further and further away from the covenant of God and would invite in the practices of worshiping to idols and the cultures that surrounded them. And so Israel and Judah became more and more vulnerable. But every so often, a king would rise up that wanted to call the people back into faith with God, back into that covenant. And Hezekiah is just that king. Even before he had taken the throne from his father, who his father was a terrible king and worshipped all kinds of idols and had put up places for all kinds of worship and, and atrocities to God. So Hezekiah comes in and what he does is he restores worship. He restores the temple, and he restores the feast, the pilgrimage, that the people would gather together with one another in community. And he invited people to come and share in this faith and this rich heritage that they had. And it was going slowly. Some people would show up at first. It's as if Hezekiah threw a party, and a few came the first time. But as time went on, more and more caught on, and the, and the nation of Judah was really having a renaissance of faith, a new reformation of faith, until a few of his leaders that were mentioned in this scripture on the side began working on their own political agendas. 
seeking their own political power and their own prestige and began trusting more in treaties with their neighboring countries and in wealth. So Assyria came knocking. Now Assyria had already wiped out Israel and now they are knocking on the door of Hezekiah and Hezekiah in this moment that Assyria comes knocking the first time prior to what we just read, he has a momentary lapse in faith, in judgment. He stops trusting in God and he temporarily puts his trust in those treaties and from his allies. He was sure Egypt was going to show up and help defend Jerusalem. It didn't work. None of the allies showed up. Well, Egypt showed up, but they were ineffective. And so then Hezekiah says, okay, I'm going to pay off Assyria. I'm going to give them a lot of wealth. I'm going to give them treasure and tribute. And that should keep peace in the land. So he does that. And Assyria at first is like really grateful for the extra, you know, boost in their economy. But when that wanes, they're like, eh, we're going to break the treaty. And they come knocking again. And now they have wiped out every fortified city that was in Judah. The last fortified city that remains is Jerusalem. And so they are knocking on this door and they are masters of intimidation. And they preach to the Hebrew people in their language, fear and folly. When I really stopped and thought about this, I thought why would it be, and I'm only speculating, why would it be that Assyria would not just come and immediately attack and take them over? Why do they pause for a moment and really try to scare the Hebrews into just turning their country over to them without having to go to war over it? And then I thought, well, maybe Assyria recognized that maybe they were stretched a little too thin. Maybe they had gone out and conquered so many different places they just didn't think they had enough to really take over Jerusalem. As if they were on a tether and they just got to the end. You know when dogs are tied up and they're like, rah, 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 but they get right to that line and, well, you really can't do anything, can you? <laughs> Maybe Assyria was thinking that, so they thought, our plan is to talk you in to becoming a vassal state of ours. We're going to be so threatening that you're just going to cave immediately. And so they do this talk where they're like, don't believe your king, because your king's going to say trust in God. You can't trust in God. Don't trust your leaders. What they told them, what was not in these verses, is that if you try and fight us and you lose, and they tell them you will lose, you will have nothing to eat or drink except for the waste that is produced from your bodies. You catch my drift, right? But they promise them that if you just cave to us now, then you'll be able to eat from your own farms and your own vineyards, and you can get your own clean water from your own wells. I can imagine how this might seem intriguing. And Hezekiah knows that he has had a lapse in judgment and forgot to trust in God, and now the Assyrians are threatening calamity. So he turns to the prophet Isaiah for prayer and guidance. And I realized, I am Hezekiah. Isaiah is speaking to me. I put on sackcloth and ashes when I see culture swallowing whole the practice of faith. Society has been so successful in redefining religion as bad, as generalizing that everyone who practices a faith is religious by definition, and by extension, they are wrong or weak or irrelevant. The idea of religion now represents a set of unyielding rules and restrictions that divide people and judge. 
This is the reputation that the Pharisees had in Jesus' day. They were restrictive, law-loving, religious zealots who made practicing faith nearly impossible for the common person. I get why so many people now identify themselves as spiritual but not religious and have become isolated and individualistic in their faith and they are now limited in the ways that they practice that faith because there is a deep misunderstanding about the covenant of God and about the commandments of God. For the past 11 weeks or so, we have had the good fortune of examining that covenant from God, examining those commandments and the promises of God that are rich and deep within the Old Testament. We know about God's covenants with his people, his steadfast faithfulness, even when the people wander away. We know about the saving acts of the flood and the escape from Egypt and the promise of land. We know about God's care for the people by giving them commandments that are not rules and restrictions, but instead instructions about how to love God and love neighbor. The commandments and the covenant are meant to free people from the bondage of human limitations and to set our hearts and our minds free to work on behalf of God. The covenants and the commandments of God draw us into community, draw us in to be with one another, to speak against isolation and individual spiritualism, and instead to point to the realism that faith cannot be practiced effectively in isolation. Faith has its greatest impact when experienced in community, but without a community. Without a community of faith, the practice of faith begins to wane. I am Hezekiah, and Isaiah is speaking to me. I put on sackcloth and ashes when growth doesn't happen the way that we plan. The voice of Reb Shecky from Isaiah's prophecy is ever present in our lives. Reb Sheki, the commander of the Assyrian army, the voice of the king of Assyria, comes to the people of Judah speaking their language and calls them to abandon their trust in God and tempts them to second guess God's commitment to them. The commander of the army wants to know why they would still have faith today. His claim is that there is no basis to have faith. Assyria has already wiped out Israel. Assyria has already wiped out all their neighbors. His voice is calling to them, calling people to put their faith in the king of Assyria, that their faith in the Lord is irrational and unfounding and unfounded. What voice is tempting you to second guess God's commitment? Every day we face the pressure to not take God at his word. There is a voice that whispers to us, that God is not our help, God is not our resource. Every day, your faith is tested and challenged. And we are tempted to hear that voice that gives comfort through prosperity to satisfy our own desires. We are called to be our own individual self and look out for ourselves. Do not rely on the Lord. Rely 
on the king of Assyria, rely on today's society. Let the king of Assyria, let our society give you prosperity. And false deliverance is offered. The way of faith is not an easy option. Trusting the Lord to deliver us from times of distress and peril is not an easy path. But it becomes reality when we do it in community. When we are called by our faith to trust in God and in that trust become part of a community. And so Hezekiah, faced with this voice out there telling the people to stop trusting, he goes to the prophet Isaiah and he says, pray for us. But Isaiah does one better. Not only does he pray for them, but he gives them instructions again. He gives them promises again. He reminds them of the promises. He says to them, trust in God. And he says, the king of Assyria will hear a rumor. He will get distracted. Squirrel. <laughs> and he will go back to his land and he will die by the sword. And that is exactly what happens. The people trusted in God, even though all the information given to them would want to call them away from that trust. They trust in God through their confession. Hezekiah confesses, I momentarily forgot who I was. I momentarily stopped trusting in God. And then they pray. They pray together that they will remain strong against the enemy, that they will remain together a community, a community of faith, a community of faith that trusts in God, that knows that the commandments are for our own good, that we might love God and love neighbor, and that God's covenant is his steadfast love for all of our days. Amen.